Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome back to Celebrating Act 2. Uh, today we have John Mariani, the virtual gourmet, and my partner, John Coleman. Uh, what's going on, guys? Hey, John, good to see you. Good to be back on, as always. You bring out the John. Beast. John, every time we talk to you, you've got uh, stories of uh, eating in restaurants and countries all around the world. And, of course, you are a world traveler. Uh, I think of you as my travel guide um, to good food, travel guide to good food. But uh, being a, a traveler, you have talked about not wanting to go on airplanes while the COVID uh, pandemic is, is uh, rampant. Things are slowing down. Airlines are getting busier. People are traveling more. Um, and things are going to change. But what would you recommend now that I look at this as an opportunity? The uh, travel industry can, it, it's like starting all over again. Um, and I think they ought to change some things. My recommendation is please don't cram these seats. Make the seats a little bigger, you know? Don't cram them so close together. What would you recommend as a traveler, world traveler, cl world class traveler? What would you recommend airlines need to do differently now that we're, quote, getting back to normal? Well, you're absolutely right that this is uh, a starting point again. And if they do it right, they will win more customers. But I'm already getting an inkling that they have no desire to do any of what I'm about to advise them to do because. I just heard yesterday that every single plane that had been mothballed is now back on the runway. This is how, and, and ticket prices are through the roof. Uh, they have said they are, they are reintroducing that middle seat as seatable. So you're going to be um, uh, sitting next to somebody like, like uh, uh, in planes, trains, and automobiles, you know, eating yes, it yes. once again. <clears throat> and of course, uh, in the uh, you cannot rent a car they said if you used to go to um, uh, Miami and get a car for 18 bucks a day it's 400 dollars a day on the weekend yes I've heard about that anything except the law of supply and demand but if they were smart these are the things that I would like to see number one okay one re-engage with travel agents Travel agents used to be paid a percentage of the tickets that they booked. And uh, the airlines at a certain point says, says nah, we don't need you anymore. Everybody goes online. Well, travel agents were extremely valuable. Um, I used to use them all the time. So one specific, you get to know this person. She says, no, you're not going to like this. Or, you know, if I book, if I book you through St. Louis and you don't use that half of the ticket, it's going to cost you half if I sent you directly to Las Vegas or something. And um, she was terrific. And the travel agents in the old days who used to go to these destinations, be invited to these uh, uh, places in, the, in uh, the old days by the hotels and so forth. So they'd go back and recommend Hotel Coleman to, yeah. so I think that they should re-engage, the airline should re-engage and get these package deals going again. People love package deals. That's why they go to Disney, you get a package deal. Uh, two. Stop the idiocy of changing fares daily. Now, if you want to have high season, peak season, and low season, that is understandable in January vis-a-vis -vis, um, the summer. But you could go on in a single day to Travelocity or any of these hotels.com, uh, cheap, cheap airlines, and that fare, depending upon the, uh, the uh, logarithmic, what do they call them, uh, the thing is, if I, I yeah. judge judge us uh, how many times you went on that site, that fare will change. And it could be going from 200, 230 to 260, 280 algorithms. And some of that is based on, aha, Mariani has gone to this site looking for a fare three times. He's really interested in going to, to Miami. So we can get him for 270. Um, this has got to stop. It's just preposterous. Three, uh, increase the number of business seats and price them cheap, uh, cheaper than they are. Because business seats are very, very popular, and they almost all get filled. So, A, why not have more of them? And, B, if you reduce the price, more people can travel 
in business. So rather than paying, let's say, now uh, $2,000 for a business class seat to fly to Rome, um, bring it down to $1,200. You know, you're going to make a lot of money on 1200 They do not, the allies do not make much money if you got a cheapo ticket to Rome for $600. But, I mean, they're making money, but there's a lot of overhead in the L.A. and industry. They make money hand over fist in business class. So give us more business class seats and make them cheaper. So more people. Now, there's supply and demand. Okay. Um, <clears throat> well, number four, this was before. Um, I'm, I'm just looking over. I'm glancing over at the, this article about the jumbo jets sitting idle on the ground um, that I think that they should uh, reconfigure uh, planes to have more, as you said, John, have more, more better seating, more better seating, wider, more leg room. This is what everybody cries out for. And, you know, you pick up the stupid magazine they have in the pocket, and there's the president, the CEO of American Airlines, United or Delta, and he's going on about how, oh, we're buying new air hoses for uh, the trucks to bring the gas and so forth. But I never talk about how we're increasing the uh, the uh, seat uh, seat width and so forth because and that's what people really want. Um, five restore food service, which nobody ever said was any good, but now you know three to four hour flight and you get triscuits, or you can pay for the lousy food that they used to give you free, which I don't think anybody in their right mind should or would want to do. Um, six bring back having magazines. Okay, now people, well, there's televisions now. Nobody's going to read a magazine. Well, that's not true. There are some people who like magazines and books, and they used to have them back there, aside from the crappy airline magazine, which used to be very good 15, 20 years ago. These are terrific authors, including moi, writing for them. But now, because they don't want to buy them, it's another, eh, people don't need them. Don't put them back there. So all they read is our crappy magazine or the things that sells uh, uh, tie clips uh, to you. Um, uh, seven, um, use this time to rethink the logistics of check-in and security lines. I mean, let's face it, uh, before COVID, it was getting worse and worse and worse uh, all the time. And um, they have just have to reconfigure uh, those lines and how much time it takes to go through. Um, before COVID, you had all the security questions, and somebody would spend five minutes saying, are you carrying a bomb? No. Are you a terrorist? No. Do you have any intention of uh, cutting the pilot's throat with a, a, a box cutter? No, we don't. Okay, well, we suppose, can we stamp you? And now, five feet from here is another person who is going to ask and stamp your passport. That has got to change, um, because, uh, again, algorithms and, I mean, my passport, certainly now will tell them all they have to know about me and that I do not even own a box cutter. I was, you know, when it'll say went at home Depot, did not buy a box cutter. <laughs> you know, this is that all of that is on my passport should be, um, eight, make universal rules about passing through detectors because they differ from airport to airport. Why do I have to take my shoes off at LaGuardia, but not take them off in Tallahassee? Why in Europe can I kind of breeze right through without removing my jacket and so forth? But then in, uh, in, in Chicago, I have to take all my clothes off and, and be scanned. Just get it down to some universal, universal thing. Um, get rid of the dreaded refund, no refund tickets. You know, you buy, oh, I got to buy you know, $300 to Chicago. Yeah, but don't you dare get sick. Don't you dare dare arrive late. Don't you dare think that you can change anything about this flight because you're not going to get a refund. As a matter of fact, I'm going to penalize you another $150. I mean, this is just bad service. This is antagonizing. I can't imagine any other industry which is this antagonizing. I mean, you know, you buy something at Home Depot, buy a box cutter and you don't like it, and you bring it back and they refund you completely. They don't say, well, it's, you know, you... You open the package, so therefore, oh, you didn't even use the package, but you let it sit around for three days. So, no, it's it's preposterous. And thir 13, and perhaps most important, require the uh, captains and the crew to tell you why we are delayed. I know I have a very good friend who is an ex-airline pilot, and he says, oh, I made it routine every 15 minutes. Even if I had nothing to report from the tower, I would tell them, I have nothing to report from the tower. 
But to sit for 45 minutes and have a guy say, well, we hope to hear something in the next hour. Um, I mean, this is crazy. People are fidgeting. People, is this a serious thing? What is taking an hour to fix? Where is the guy? They say, well, they're bringing a guy over from maintenance, you know. Well, how long does that take? What, does he have to bring over an entire engine? Is he going to have to bring a screwdriver? One time I was on a, on a flight, and a uh, one of the overhead bin doors wouldn't, wouldn't click. There was nothing in it. Wouldn't click shut, okay? Oh, sorry, going to be delayed here, ladies and gentlemen. They always talk like they come from Indiana. Well, it's not like Herb Schreiner, right? Um, and uh, sorry, but ladies and gentlemen, we have to send somebody over for maintenance to take care of this open bin that nothing is in that could possibly fall on your head. And everybody goes, like this. So there's a guy in row 10C who gets up and goes up to the stewardess and the pilot flashes his American Airlines maintenance guy tag who just happened to be on the plane. He goes up to the bin, pushes it with one finger closed, done. Well, that was great, right? But I, we still have to sign some papers that the work was done and send it back to maintenance. <sighs> Goodbye, audience. Well, John. Yes. John, I would, I would agree with nine out of your ten. But number whatever it was, eight or nine, about the what we used to call the fly-or-die tickets, mm -hmm. I would disagree with for two reasons. Number one, uh, from my point of view, buying a fly or die ticket saved a ton of money. That was a real discount. If you would, if you were willing to do a fly or die ticket, mm -hmm. you really would. That was the cheapest way to go. So I like that part of it. Good gambling. Okay, but here's yeah, the but other. On the, but, but on the other side, it, uh, the likelihood is that if you cancel even uh, uh, the morning of an uh, evening flight, they're going to fill the seat. If they fill the seat, then there shouldn't be any reason why uh, you should have to pay for it. I mean, literally. But, you know, yeah. they're doing it because what they've done is they've reduced, because of the high uh, fuel costs, they've reduced the number of planes they're putting in the air to make sure that they're all booked to the gills. Mm -hmm. And uh, but basically until something happens where people choose alternate means or they get so pricey, that people stop flying, uh, and then all of a sudden they're going to have you know this moment of well let's take care of our customers a little bit better. Uh, the thing I found interesting, and I don't know whether or not you've looked into this, uh, John, is that there are now much more advertising on TV, particularly on uh, uh, the uh, the old day networks, about the private jet companies that have uh, literally right. jets all over the U.S. and the world. And I wonder, from a business class standpoint, how much uh, how that might compete, because uh, that might be a way to go to get a more comfortable seat and a meal and all the other things you're looking for. It may wind up not being that much more expensive than a business class on most uh, airlines today. Have you looked into that? Uh, I don't have a general statement to make, except that what you say can and may be true because you can bargain. You can call up one of these uh, airlines and say, well, we were, we're sending six of our um, our top guys out to uh, mm -hmm. Cleveland. And uh, what, what, what is it? Well, that would cost $10,000. Well, well, can we get it down? To, you know, you know, th these are bargaining shifts. But um, the airlines generally do not seem to be very much interested in, uh, in accommodating us at all. I mean, you guys remember that if you were flying out of LAX, and you missed your seven o'clock flight. There may be one at eight o'clock. And they said, all right, just wait until eight o'clock. Those days are done. But more so, and I did this all the time, run up to TWA. Oh, that flight left, sir. But Pan Am has a flight in 20 minutes. I think you can make it. Just take, just take our ticket and go down to Pan Am. Because all the tickets, oh, everybody's charging the same amount of money. Mm. Yes. They yeah. lost seven hundred dollars, but Pan Am gained it, and then the, tomorrow is going to be a flush. Well, I think we're of yeah. a certain age that I remember, uh, particularly at John Wayne uh, Airport and a, a few other airports. Is that first of all, uh, let's be for security. You just run up with a plane with a nice little smile on its nose, and you get on board. And if it hadn't left it, you just walk up the stairs. You get on board. You pay on, on board. And you'd be in San Francisco, you know, an hour later, or the Eastern Airlines shuttle right. uh, uh, back in New York. 
where they they ran every 20 minutes and oh this one filled up doesn't matter if the next one's scheduled for an hour from now we'll just bring another one and fill that one up and they just keep that. going they and brought another airplane to your gate mm -hmm. yeah well there's no question that the airline industry has been through lots of ups and ups and downs over the years but there's also no question that they really need to do reform. Down again. That's what they do. Right. <laughs> what, what they have to do is they have to start advertising like they did in the old day, but using you, uh, John Mariani, but saying, hi, my name is Mariani. Fly me. Yeah. So. Which was used <laughs> by a 22-year-old shapely girl in a miniskirt with a silly hat on. Well, meet the new 20-year-old shapely miniskirted guy who doesn't wear a miniskirt. I think, John, you should be the spokesperson and the brand of uh, the airline that treats you right. You know, I would, uh, I forget who it was, United, Fly the Friendly Skies. I would just rewrite um, that and have me or anybody say, Fly the Friendly Skies of United. And we really mean it. Right. And then, that. you might get a pimple in your tongue, though. Why the friendly skies? No, this is lean in and say, really, we're going to take good care of you. <laughs> anyway. We're going to take good care of you like Singapore Airlines takes care of their customers, which is... So I think, I think we should invite our audience to uh, send to... Uh, uh, go to the Virtual Gourmet uh, online at johnmariani.com and send him, uh, if you've ever been treated by an airline nicely... OK, and don't don't worry about getting a lot of emails. Send it to John so that he can report to us uh, the, the uh, few instances where the airlines treat you right. Yes. And, and please send twenty five dollars for postage and handling. <laughs> and it's not refundable. <laughs> not refundable. <laughs> See you guys. Take care. Bye bye. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.